This is Space Time, Series 23, Episode 5, for broadcast on the 15th of January 2020. Coming up on Space Time, the birth of a black hole witnessed through gravitational waves. Fast radio bursts get even more mysterious. And have they finally found evidence of active volcanism on Venus? All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Astronomers have confirmed their second gravitational wave detection of two neutron stars merging to create a black hole. The detection on the 25th of April 2019 was made by the LIGO Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory in Livingston, Louisiana, and the European Virgo Gravitational Wave Detector in Pisa, Italy. The discovery has now been reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. The only other gravitational wave detection of two neutron stars merging to form a black hole took place in August 2017. But unlike that first merger, which was detected in electromagnetic radiation as well as gravitational waves, the April 25th merger, which occurred some 520 million light years away, didn't result in any light being detected. Australian National University Professor Susan Scott, who was part of the team that studied the cataclysmic event, says the Hanford Washington State LIGO detector was offline at the critical moment for the latest event, and that made achieving a visual confirmation of the collision too challenging. The ANU led efforts to try and locate the neutron star collision by scanning a massive region of the southern sky for bright light from the explosion using the SkyMapper telescope. Scott says the simple fact of this neutron star collision, some five times more distant than the 2017 merger, meant the region of the sky being searched was simply too large, and it was like looking for a needle in a haystack. However, an analysis of the gravitational wave data from the merger, which has been catalogued as GW190425, has come up with some rather fascinating results. Especially interesting was the fact that the merging neutron stars have a combined mass of approximately 3.4 times that of the Sun, with the masses of the two individual neutron stars in the binary system being around 2 and 1.4 solar masses respectively. Scott says astronomers were surprised by the total mass, which far exceeds the masses of known neutron star binaries in our galaxy. This leads to the intriguing possibility that binary systems may have formed differently to those observed in the Milky Way galaxy, or that neutron star binaries in this mass range may not be detectable by current telescope surveys. From conventional observations using light, astronomers already knew of 17 binary neutron star systems in our galaxy, and have estimated the masses of these systems with the biggest being some 2.9 times that of the Sun. So clearly, none of them come close to GW190425's mass range. One possibility for the unusually high mass in this collision is that the collision took place not between two neutron stars, but between a neutron star and a stellar mass black hole, since black holes are heavier than neutron stars. But for this to be the case, it meant the black hole would have had to have been exceptionally small for its class. Instead, scientists think it's much more likely that LIGO did in fact witness a shattering of two neutron stars. Scott says the data coming from this latest collision is surprising. What we know is that each of the component masses of this binary look like they're in the standard neutron star range. But the really interesting thing about this particular neutron star collision is that the overall mass of the binary system is much larger than we know of any other binary system that we've seen, be it in our galaxy or, or otherwise. By being more massive, what can we learn from that? What sort of indications does that give astronomers, does that give physicists as to what it tells us about the sort of masses neutron stars can reach and, and where the boundary is between, say, what's a neutron star and what collapses beyond that to form a black hole? Yes, well, it's thrown up a lot of very interesting uh, questions and Firstly, because it is so massive compared to the, the pairs that we've seen, is it that it formed in a different way to, for instance, this sample of binary neutron star pairs within our galaxy in the Milky Way? And that, that is certainly a possibility. But it, it's also possible that we're unable to see neutron star pairs of this massive type with our standard radio pulsar survey because they could, for instance, be in very, very tight orbits with very quick orbital periods, less than an hour. And so 
we'd have real problems with the signals there due to Doppler smearing and so on. So it may be that we do have a population of massive binary neutron star systems in the galaxy, but we just are unable to observe them by conventional means. The other thing is that there's also a possibility that they may have existed in the Milky Way at a much earlier period, but have coalesced and now belong to the, you know, pulsar graveyard, and uh, we won't be able to observe any further ones in the Milky Way. There, there are a number of different scenarios which come out of this event. One of the problems is that we haven't got a electromagnetic radiation counterpart to the gravitational wave signals with this event. Yes. Now, the problem was that one of the LIGO detectors was actually offline for about two hours, including the time of the event. So really, we only got this signal in LIGO Livingston, basically. Virgo did get the signal, but it was sub-threshold. Mm. So really, it was only a strong signal in one detector. And that means that we have a much lower ability to work out where on the sky the signal came from. We can only get it you know, get a fairly large region of sky. And the space fact that it was big. Sort of, uh, space is big, that's right. And we, we ended up with, you know, like a, a 16% portion of the sky, which is huge. And because of that, and because this event was five times more distant than our first binary neutron star collision, obviously any electromagnetic signals would be a lot weaker anyway. And the combination of the two things meant that although we searched, including with the SkyMapper Optical Transient Telescope based from ANU, everybody was trying to cover the area, but we didn't actually find it. Being so much further away, does that change the amplitude or something of the gravitational waves themselves? Does that change what we get? Yes, it does. It, it, it squares inversely with the distance. And so that's why we can only detect, you know, say our standard binary black hole collisions out to a certain distance. And that distance is now really quite large. But it just means that beyond that, the signal is too weak to actually call it in our you know, data stream. So, yes, it, it applies to us as well, but it, it does certainly applies to the astronomers. And we do expect one day with increased sensitivity of our detectors to reach a situation where we're detecting events that astronomers won't be able to see them anyway because they're just too distant. There's been speculation that maybe what we've just witnessed back in April, what we've seen was actually uh, possibly a uh, merger between a neutron star and a black hole. Yes, I mean, we haven't ruled out that possibility, although the masses involved are like 2.2 yeah. yeah. solar masses and 1.4 solar masses. And so... Tiny you know, black hole then. <laughs> yeah, much smaller than any black hole that we've been able to ascertain a mass of, you know, in the universe and our other studies. And, you know, in fact, there's this sort of mass gap between about two and a half and five solar masses. And we're very interested with our detections in probing that mass gap to see what can be in there. Can it be an even heavier neutron star or could it be lighter black holes? Now, we do think that there's a high likelihood that this collision produced a black hole. And so this, you know, in the, in the range, let's say, three and a half solar masses, this would lie in that gap. So already we're finding suggestive evidence that we can at least form black holes through, say, neutron star collisions such that the mass of the formed black hole is in that mass gap. There's this Chandrasekhar limit, 1.44 times the mass of the sun, which is roughly where electron degeneracy occurs, so that a stellar core beyond that mass can crush down beyond a white dwarf stage to become a neutron star. And the next step then is, where is that boundary of neutron degeneracy between when you're a neutron star and when you become a stellar mass black hole? That's exactly right. That's a, a question we all want to know the answer to. You know, obviously from electromagnetic observations, they do have a sort of heaviest neutron star um, that they've observed, you know, which is in the order of around, you know, 2.2, 2.3 solar masses. But um, we can't say for sure where that exact limit that you've talked about will be. And that's why as we have more and more of these detections, as well as obviously the astronomers continuing their observations, this will help to fine tune that. And obviously all this is related to the, the nature of nuclear matter in neutron stars. And, mm. and really it's by observing these neutron star collisions, both with gravitational waves and through electromagnetic means that we can actually probe the nature of that nuclear matter and get 
a better uh, way to formulate our theories about these these sort of mass limits and so on. Yeah, there's a lot of theories, not just about neutron degeneracy, but also about quark degeneracy, proton degeneracy, exactly where's that? that that's exact, exactly right. And one of the, the best ways we're going to have to open a window onto looking at those sort of questions is through our binary neutron star collisions. And that's why we're very, very keen to get more of them as we head into the future. That's Professor Susan Scott from the Australian National University. Each LIGO observatory fires lasers into a beam splitter, which shoots the beams along two perpendicular four-kilometre-long tubes equipped with mirrored test masses at each end. The reflected laser light is then sent back to the detector, where eventually they should theoretically recombine. However, as a gravitational wave generated by something like a moving mass or merging black holes passes through the cosmos, it causes the fabric of space-time to stretch and compress ever so slightly, but just a tiny fraction of the diameter of a proton. When a gravitational wave passes through the LIGO detector, local space-time, including the two beam lines and test masses, are also stretched and compressed ever so slightly, leaving them slightly out of phase. And that's the signature that a gravitational event's just taken place. Using multiple gravitational wave detectors around the Earth allows scientists to determine the general direction of the wave source. And in this case, scientists think that source was a pair of neutron stars. When stars like our Sun reach the end of their lives, having fused most of the hydrogen in their core into helium, the balancing act between gravity crushing a star down towards its centre and the nuclear energy pushing outwards ends, and gravity wins, causing the stellar core to collapse inwards. Now, this additional mass crushing down on the core causes a dramatic increase in temperature and pressure. Eventually, it's enough to trigger what's called a helium flash, making the core hot enough to begin fusing helium into carbon and oxygen. At the same time, a hydrogen shell begins to burn surrounding the core, and the star's outer layers expand due to this increased heat, causing this outer envelope to move further away from the core. And because it's now further away from the core, this outer envelope cools down. This combination of expansion and cooling turns the star into what astronomers call a red giant. Eventually, stars like our Sun will fuse most of their core helium into carbon and oxygen but they simply don't have enough mass to fuse carbon and oxygen into heavier elements. And so the fusion process ends. Their outer gaseous envelopes detach and float away from the star as planetary nebulae, leaving the stellar core exposed as a white dwarf, which will slowly cool over the eons of time. However, stars far more massive than our Sun face a very different fate. Because they're so massive, with higher core temperatures and pressures, they fuse hydrogen into helium through a different process. And then, once they've used up all the core hydrogen, they go on to fuse progressively heavier and heavier elements in their core and shell. The helium fuses into carbon, which fuses into nitrogen, oxygen, neon, magnesium, silicon, sulfur, nickel, and eventually iron. The thing is, no matter how big a star is, it's never going to be massive enough to fuse iron into heavier elements. And so that balancing act between gravity crushing the star down towards its centre and the nuclear fusion pushing outwards reaches a final conclusion, with gravity again being the winner, this time causing the star to crush inwards in an event called a core collapse or type 2 supernova. For stellar cores greater than about 1.44 solar masses, a figure known as the Chandrasekhar limit, this immense gravitational collapse is enough to break through electron degeneracy, the quantum mechanical effect arising from the Pauli exclusion principle, which prevents more than one fermion, such as an electron, from being in the same minimum energy level quantum state at the same time. So having broken through electron degeneracy, it allows further collapse, crushing the negatively charged electrons and positively charged protons together to form neutronium, hence the name of the star. Although only a dozen or so kilometres wide, neutron stars are the densest known objects in the universe, other than black holes. In fact, just a sugar cube-sized piece of neutron star material would weigh over 100 million tonnes. Neutron stars are thought to be composed of a solid, rigid outer crust or shell made up of ions and electrons. Directly below this is a fluid inner crust about 2 kilometres thick made up of electrons, neutrons and atomic nuclei. Now, this is thought to surround an up to 9 kilometer thick outer core of neutron, proton, Fermi fluid and electron Fermi gas. The inner core, which would be about 3 or 4 kilometers in radius, is probably made up of a quark-gluon plasma. 
Neutron stars also rotate very rapidly, generating powerful energy beams which are thought to emanate from near the star's surface. Now, if the rotational axis of the neutron star isn't lined up with its magnetic poles, then the star emits a sweeping beam of energy flashing across the cosmos like a lighthouse beacon. We call these neutron stars pulsars. Now, the majority of pulsars spin at rates about once per second, but some have been recorded with rotational rates of up to 650 times a second. Anything spinning faster than around 50 milliseconds is generally referred to as a millisecond pulsar. Neutron stars rotate very quickly and very regularly, at least that is until they suddenly don't. Occasionally, a neutron star will suddenly start to spin faster, caused by portions of the inside of the star moving outwards. This is called a glitch, and it provides astronomers with a brief insight into what lies inside these mysterious objects. You're listening to Space Time. Coming up next, fast radio bursts get even more mysterious, evidence of active volcanism on Venus, and later in the science report, new data shows that 2019 was Australia's hottest and driest year on record. All that and more coming up on Space Time. One of the universe's great unsolved mysteries has just become even more puzzling. The riddle concerns strange unexplained blasts of energy known as fast radio bursts. First detected back in 2007, fast radio bursts are sudden, massively powerful flashes of electromagnetic radiation in the radio part of the spectrum, lasting just a few thousandths of a second, yet powerful enough to be seen billions of light years away. Their cause remains a mystery. Most fast radio bursts are one-off single events. But there are others which repeat from the same location over and over again, allowing astronomers to learn more about them. Back in 2016, astronomers traced a fast radio burst that repeated quick pulsing radio signals in random bursts to a distant dwarf galaxy with a high rate of star formation located some 3 billion light years away. Astronomers have also traced three non-repeating fast radio bursts to distant massive galaxies with very little star formation underway. So, this seemed to suggest that repeating and non-repeating fast radio bursts are caused by different types of events. And this is where it gets complicated. The new research, reported in the journal Nature, has pinpointed the origin of a fast radio burst catalogued as FRB 1809.16.J0158-65 to a nearby spiral galaxy located 500 million light years away, catalogued as SDSSJ0158.28-6542-53.6. That makes this the closest known fast radio burst to Earth, and only the second repeating burst source to have its location pinpointed in the sky. But it also means it's located in a radically different place compared to all the other known fast radio bursts. And that's challenging science's assumptions about the origins of these already enigmatic extragalactic events. The study's lead author, Kenzie Nemo from the University of Amsterdam, says this is blurring the differences between repeating and non-repeating fast radio bursts. It could be they're being produced in a wide variety of locations across the universe, and they simply require some very specific conditions to make them visible. As their name suggests, fast radio bursts can only be detected with radio telescopes, so radio observatories are fundamentally necessary to accurately determine their position in the sky. Now, this particular burst was discovered by CHIME, the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment Radio Telescope Array, back in 2018. The new observations use the European Very Long Baseline Interferometer Network, a collection of radio telescopes widely dispersed across the globe, which are electronically linked up to operate as one large single telescope. It was this which allowed the authors to precisely localize the source. But measuring the precise distance and local environment of the radio source was only possible with follow-up optical observations, Astronomers used cameras and spectrographs on the Gemini North Telescope to image the faint structures of the host galaxy where the fast radio burst resides, measure its distance, and analyze its chemical composition. The observations showed that this fast radio burst originated in a spiral arm of the galaxy, a region which is rapidly forming new stars, a discovery which is further deepening this astronomical mystery. You're listening to Space Time. Still to come, evidence of volcanism on Venus and what's termed a ground current event hits Norway. All that and more still to come on Space Time. (music) 
For years, astronomers have been speculating that the planet Venus has active volcanism. But while there have been lots of science supporting that hypothesis, positive proof of recent volcanism has been lacking. At least it might have until now. A new study suggests that lava flows on Venus may be only a few years old, and that raises the likelihood that Venus is still volcanically active today. Now, if correct, it would make Venus the only planet in the solar system other than Earth to undergo recent volcanic eruptions. Venus is Earth's sister planet and its closest planetary neighbour, and the two are remarkably similar. They're almost the same size, they have similar mass and diameter, and because they were both formed in the same part of the solar system under similar conditions, they have very similar compositions. And like Earth, Venus is clouds. In fact, Venus once excited speculation that it could host man's first colony in space. See, scientists thought the dense cloud cover meant there must be lots of rain on Venus. After all, it's closer to the sun than the Earth is, so temperatures would be warmer, which would mean more water evaporation, which would mean more rain clouds. So, scientists envisaged that under its thick cloud cover, Earth's sister planet was probably covered in lush green tropical rainforests, a sort of Amazon jungle on steroids. Some even went so far as to imagine that tropical rainforest must have meant the planet was full of dinosaurs. But in reality, if Venus is Earth's sister planet, then it's a twisted sister. American, Soviet and European spacecraft have revealed Venus to be the closest thing to hell in our solar system. It's a world with a runaway greenhouse effect. Its surface is scorchingly hot, with average temperatures of 462 degrees Celsius. That's hot enough to melt lead. And as for those thick, opaque planet-shrouding clouds, well, they do cause rain, but the rain isn't water. Rather, it's droplets of metal-eating sulfuric acid. In fact, the clouds are so heavy, they crush Venus's rich carbon dioxide-based atmosphere, acting like the lid on a pressure cooker. Still, scientists have seen what look like snow caps on some of Venus's tall mountain ranges. But the thing is, that snow isn't frozen water. It's actually metallic. The surface of Venus is dominated by well over 1,600 volcanic structures, more than any other planet in the solar system, including the Earth. Its surface is 90% basalt and consists of a mosaic of volcanic lava plains, showing evidence of regular periodic resurfacing by floods of lava. All this indicates that volcanism has played a major role in shaping the planet's surface. In fact, based on the density of impact craters on the surface of Venus, the planet may have had a major global resurfacing event just 500 million years ago. Radar sightings by NASA's Magellan probe revealed evidence for comparatively recent volcanic activity on Venus's highest volcano, Mat Mons, in the form of ash flows near the summit and on its northern flank. Although there are many lines of evidence which suggest that Venus is likely to be volcanically active, present-day eruptions on Mat Mons have never been confirmed. Venus has shield volcanoes, widespread lava flows, unusual volcanoes called pancake domes, and arachnoid or tick-like structures called scallop margin domes, which have never been found on Earth. And interestingly, there's absolutely no evidence of any type of plate tectonic activity on Venus. Being closer to the Sun than the Earth, Venus orbits our local star every 224.7 Earth days. More interestingly, Venus rotates in retrograde compared to most other planets in our solar system, including the Earth. That means the Sun rises in the west and sets in the east. And it's a slow rotation. In fact, a day on Venus takes some 243 Earth days. The Russians, or more precisely Soviet Union, have sent numerous spacecraft to the surface of Venus, but they've all had a tough time surviving. The first few were crushed and cooked in the Venusian atmosphere long before reaching the ground. Finally, one probe did make it all the way down to the surface, surviving long enough to send back just a few seconds of data and images. What scientists saw was a barren, parched world, bathed in half-yellow light by the thick cloud cover. The surface was composed of nothing but jagged slabs of maroon-coloured rocks, baked over the eons to create a haunting desert scape, periodically resurfaced by volcanism. And that's where our new study comes in. A report in the journal Science Advances claims new lava dating techniques have allowed scientists to show that some lava flows on Venus are likely to be only a few years old. Until recently, the ages of lava eruptions and volcanoes on Venus weren't well understood because the alteration rate of fresh lava wasn't well constrained. So, 
the authors of our story recreated Venus's hot, caustic atmosphere in the laboratory to investigate how Venusian minerals react and change over time. Their experimental results have shown that once erupted onto the surface, an abundant mineral in basalt called olivine reacts rapidly with the atmosphere and in weeks becomes coated with the iron oxide minerals magnetite and hematite. They also found that observations by the European Space Agency's Venus Express spacecraft showed that on the planet itself, these changes in mineralogy could take place within just a few years. The study's lead author, Justin Filiberto from the Lunar and Planetary Institute, says the findings suggest that these lava flows on Venus are very young, which would imply that Venus does indeed have active volcanoes today. He says if Venus is indeed active today, it would make a great place to visit to better understand the interiors of planets, studying how planets cool and why the Earth and Venus have active volcanism, but Mars does not. The data means future missions should be able to see these flows and changes in the surface of Venus and provide concrete evidence of its activity. You're listening to Space Time. Coming up next, ground current events hit Norway. And later in the science report, new data shows that 2019 was Australia's hottest and driest year on record. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Scientists have detected what are called ground current events across Norway. Researchers at the Polar Light Centre Geophysical Observatory in Lofoten recorded the sudden shockwave surge of strong variation in both ground electrical currents and the local magnetic field. As these currents flowed through the Norwegian ground, dynamic aurorae with fast-moving green needles and purple fringes suddenly filled the Scandinavian winter skies for more than an hour. These events came 15 minutes after NASA's ACE spacecraft detected a sudden 180-degree change in the interplanetary magnetic field and a five-fold jump in solar wind density. These kind of events are usually triggered by solar flares and coronal mass ejections, blasting powerful jets of plasma towards the Earth, generating geomagnetic storms. But the thing is, the Sun was quiet at this time. And that's the mystery. Scientists think what's happened is that the Earth may have passed through a fold in the heliospheric current sheet, a wave of electromagnetic currents where the polarity of the Sun's magnetic field flips. Now, this sheet's about 10,000 kilometres thick in the vicinity of Earth's orbit, and it ripples like a blanket throughout the entire solar system. The shape of the sheet is dictated by the Sun's rotating magnetic field on the plasma in the interplanetary medium, the solar wind. Scientists say crossing the heliospheric current sheet could cause these type of events. The rapidly changing magnetic fields affected energetic particles in the magnetosphere, which then rained down on the upper atmosphere, generating both the aurora and triggering the ground currents. You're listening to Space Time. SpaceX has launched its third batch of 60 Starlink satellites into orbit. The mid-evening flight aboard a Falcon 9 rocket from Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral in Florida went smoothly with the successful deployment of the satellites and the successful landing of the first stage booster on the drone ship, of course I still love you, which had been pre-positioned downrange in the North Atlantic Ocean. Go for launch. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1... Zero. Ignition. And we have just had liftoff of our Falcon 9 vehicle carrying our Starlink payload. In just about 15 seconds from now, we will be passing through Max Q. This is the largest aerodynamic pressure that the vehicle will see throughout ascent. Vehicle is passing through maximum dynamic pressure. And we just heard that call out for passing through max Q. Now coming up in about a minute will be a rapid succession of events. Main engine cutoff, or what we call MECO, followed immediately by stage separation and SES-1, which is second engine start. Now MECO is where we shut down that main engine on the first stage booster to allow the vehicle to slow down just enough to separate from second chill. stage. And there is MECO, as those engines shut down. Stage separation confirmed. And there is stage separation and 
second engine start. Now in about 20 seconds, we will have fairing deploy. Fairing separation confirmed. And there is fairing deploy. We will be attempting to catch one of the fairing halves on our recovery vessel, Miss Tree. Acquisition of signal, Bermuda. Now there are a series of events coming up with both stage one and stage two before we reach our parking orbit and enter that first coast phase. The first is the stage one entry burn. That is when stage one is re-entering the Earth's upper atmosphere. It will reignite three of its Merlin 1D engines in order to slow the vehicle down as it re-enters so that it doesn't break apart because we want to land it. That burn's going to last for just under 20 seconds or so, and at that point, the burn will end. You'll hear the call-out entry burn shut down. A couple minutes after that, we will see our stage one landing burn. That is where we will reignite one engine, E9. It's that one right in the middle, and it's going to burn for just over 20 seconds and hopefully leave stage one standing up nice and tall on that drone ship. But at the very second same stage time... On nominal trajectory. As you just heard, second stage is on a nominal trajectory. That's really good news. And speaking of second stage, right as the drone ship lands, you should hear the call out for Seco 1. That's where we shut down the second stage engine to enter that coast phase. So far, stage 2's trajectory continues to be nominal. Stage 1 has also drifted up to its highest altitude and is now beginning its descent. Stage 1, entry burn startup. Meanwhile, the second stage continues at full power with over 200,000 pounds of thrust. Stage 2 following nominal trajectory. Now, stage 2 continues to burn, taking those Starlink satellites to their first parking orbit. Stage 1 is coasting down, steering its way using those grid fins down to the drone ship. At about T plus 8 minutes and 3 seconds, right around there, you're going to see that landing burn start. Stage 1 entry transonic. Oh, and as you just heard, we've just gone transonic on stage 1 as it's making its way back down to the drone ship. So the atmosphere is actually what's slowing the vehicle down, stage 1 as it re it's now re-entering the Earth's atmosphere and coming down to the thicker parts. That's what slows the vehicle down. Stage one, landing burn, start up. All right, stage, stage one, making its way. Stage two is under terminal guidance. Stage one, landing All like right. deploy. And yes, <laughs> we have another landing. This is the fourth landing of this vehicle on the 48th Falcon 9 first stage landing today. This is awesome. <laughs> All right, stage two stage is still two doing FTS work. Stage two, Seco should be coming up any moment. Seco. We've heard confirmation of Seco. Keep below us expected. And let's listen to see if we're in a good GNC orbit. confirms good insertion. All right, and GNC has confirmed good orbital insertion. The satellites were released about an hour after liftoff into a 290-kilometer high orbit. They then began engaging their ion thrusters to climb to an operational orbit of 550 kilometers. The mission brings to 180 the total number of satellites now in the Starlink constellation, and it marks the latest step in SpaceX boss Elon Musk's plans to set up a giant constellation of thousands of satellites to create a massive global broadband internet satellite network. He already has US authorization to launch some 12,000 satellites in several different orbits, and he's applied to fly at least 30,000. But eventually, Musk would like to see Starlink have over 42,000 satellites in its constellation. Now, think of that for a minute. At the moment, there are roughly 2,100 active satellites orbiting our planet. It's going to get pretty crowded up there. Musk hopes to eventually control up to 5% of the global internet market. They share valued at around $30 billion a year in today's terms, roughly 10 times what SpaceX is now earning from space launches. SpaceX says Starlink should be operational for people in Canada and the northern United States by next year. Of course, the prospect of such crowded skies is a concern to astronomers worried over the threat it poses to our view of the cosmos. Scientists say the proliferation of so many bright metallic satellites could easily degrade the night view, interfering with both optical and radio astronomy. Another concern is that the sheer number of satellites increases the risk of orbital collisions, no matter how careful you are. These collisions could occur both with other operational satellites, but also, more likely, with the millions of bits of space junk already posing a threat to safe spacecraft navigation. The cascading effect from such collisions would create thousands of additional bits of space junk, which theoretically, and that's not that far away from reality in this case, could eventually make space unsafe to fly. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. New data shows that 2019 was Australia's hottest and driest year on record. 
The figures by the Bureau of Meteorology show the year which delivered crippling drought, blinding dust storms, record heat waves and devastating bushfires had average daily temperatures some 1.52 degrees Celsius higher than the long-term average. The previous record was back in 2013 when temperatures reached 1.33 degrees Celsius above average. In fact, the last seven years have been among Australia's 10 warmest years on record, with temperatures rising just over a degree Celsius on average since 1910. At the same time, the nation's average annual rainfall has dropped by a devastating 40% to just 277.6 millimetres. That's the lowest on record and easily surpasses the 1902 Federation drought when average annual rainfall dropped to just 314 millimetres. The Bureau says the data confirms fears that Australia could be in for longer, more frequent and more extreme fire seasons. Making matters worse, the record-breaking temperatures and drought occurred without an El Nino, the climate event which usually triggers hot, dry conditions down under. A new study warns that those weekend late nights and morning lions, along with being more of a night owl, could influence your weight, especially if you're an adolescent girl. A report in the Journal of the American Medical Association found that greater social jet lag, which is the amount of sleep in past your normal wake-up time on weekends you get, together with a preference for evenings over mornings, were associated with an increase in fat levels and waist circumference in adolescent girls, but not in boys. The authors suggest that families can support adolescents by encouraging consistency in sleep schedules and limiting electronic media and caffeine use in the evenings, as well as establishing earlier and more consistent bed and wake times. Clearly, none of these authors have teenage children. A new study suggests that theropod dinosaurs, originally described as Nanotyrannus, a small cousin of Tyrannosaurus rex, may actually have been a juvenile T. rex. The findings reported in the journal Science Advances are based on a new analysis of fossils. Paleontologists say the largest T. rex individuals measured more than 12 metres long, weighed over 8 tonnes, and may have lived for more than 30 years. T. rex fossils were first discovered in North America more than a century ago. Then in the 1940s, paleontologists unearthed a fossilised skull that, although similar to that of T. rex, was only about half its size and with dagger-like teeth of a different design to those of T. rex. Eventually, more specimens were discovered and the species was named Nanotyrannus. But over the past 15 years, debate has raged about whether Nanotyrannus was in fact a separate species from T. rex. Now, a closer study of bone growth rings and blood vessels in Nanotyrannus shows that its tissues were still growing vigorously, as they would for individuals that weren't fully mature, and that suggests that these were adolescents rather than adult dinosaurs, possibly teenage T. rexes. Archaeologists have unearthed a 2,000-year-old stone measuring table at a dig site in Jerusalem. The rare second temple-era table was discovered in a broad-paved courtyard at a site known as Steep Street, which archaeologists believe was the town's central market. The table would have belonged to the market's manager in charge of the weights and measures and would have been used to measure out liquid volumes. Stone weights were also discovered nearby, further supporting the idea that this was the site of vast trade activity. Steep Street was a 600-metre-long, 8-metre-wide paved roadway lined with shops on either side which connected the Salome Pool with the Temple Mount and was used by Jewish pilgrims 2,000 years ago on their way to worship at the Second Temple. The site was buried by the Romans when they sacked Jerusalem and forced the Israelites out of their Jewish homeland in the year 40. Iran says it will no longer abide by restrictions on its nuclear program. Those limits were the centerpiece of the 2015 Iranian nuclear deal, designed to hamper Tehran's efforts to build an atomic bomb. Under the deal, Iran was limited to operating around 5,000 basic centrifuges, enriching uranium to no more than 3.7%, enough to fuel nuclear reactors, not enough to create atomic weapons. The agreement also limited Iran's stockpile of uranium to no more than 202.8 kilograms. Now, as we've reported previously on this program, Tehran has openly been violating these restrictions for years through incremental breaches. Back in May 2019, Iran announced that it would step up its uranium enrichment to levels of 4.5%. Now, that's still well below the 90% weapons grade needed to make an atomic bomb, but it was clearly a step in that direction. And just a few months later, Tehran confirmed that it had also exceeded its uranium stockpile limits and that it had brought online new trains of high-capacity, more advanced centrifuges, 
with even more sophisticated versions on their way. So, it means Iran no longer honours previously agreed to restrictions on how much uranium it enriches, or whether or not that uranium is enriched to weapons grade. Tehran's also been breaching its agreements by continuing to develop ballistic missiles for use as nuclear weapons delivery systems under the guise of a so-called space program. The United Nations International Atomic Energy Agency says that during the early 2000s, the Islamic Republic explored various fusing, arming and firing systems designed to make its missiles more capable of reliably delivering a thermonuclear warhead. In 2018, the full extent of Iran's secret nuclear weapons development facilities were exposed by Israeli Mossad agents, who released a treasure trove of some 55,000 documents obtained from Iran's secret nuclear archive, outlining Tehran's clandestine Project Amid nuclear weapons program. The oil-rich nation's claims that its nuclear program was for peaceful power generation only were always considered deceitful and dishonest, and never supported by the available evidence. Iran currently has less than half of the 1,050 kilograms of enriched uranium needed to construct a single nuclear weapon. However, the United Nations International Atomic Energy Agency's inspectors were often refused entry to key nuclear sites suspected of being involved in atomic weapons research. So there's a lot that's simply not known. Best estimates suggest Iran's breakout time, that is, the length of time it would take Tehran to develop a nuclear weapon from where it is now, could be as little as seven months. Before the 2015 deal, Iran had enough uranium to potentially build more than a dozen nuclear bombs. The Islamic Republic's also threatened to restart construction of a heavy water reactor that could produce plutonium, potentially opening another path to a mass fissile material for an atomic bomb. It took Iran's close technology partner North Korea three years from the time it left the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty until it was able to detonate its first atomic weapon. With the data that Tehran's gained from Pyongyang, it'll take Iran far less time. Of course, this latest escalation in the Gulf crisis followed a US drone strike which killed Iranian General Qasem Soleimani, long considered the world's most important terrorist puppet master, who organized and funded thousands of attacks by Iranian proxy militant terror groups such as Hezbollah, Hamas and Islamic Jihad. The 62-year-old head of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Quds Force was travelling in a convoy from Baghdad Airport in Iraq with another key figure in Iran's mostly Shiite terror network when they were hit. Retired US General Dev Petraeus says Soleimani's death was more significant than the elimination of al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden or Islamic State head Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. The former CIA director says Soleimani was responsible for the death of over 600 U.S. soldiers and the architect and operational commander of Iran's efforts to establish control over the entire Middle East region. Put simply, after the Ayatollah, he was the most important person in the Iranian government. The network of Iranian proxy terrorist groups he set up stretches from Pakistan and Afghanistan in the east, west across Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, Bahrain, Cyprus and the Palestinian territories. It extends right across Africa, enveloping Senegal, Gambia, Kenya, Sudan and Egypt, with terror cells also established in South Africa and Nigeria. And it runs north into Turkey, Azerbaijan, Georgia and even Bulgaria. Thanks to Soleimani, Tehran's tentacles have also spread to terror cells across Europe, India, Eastern Asia, including Thailand, across South America, into Mexico and even as far as the United States and Canada. While Shiite Muslims mourned his death and called for bloody revenge, celebrations broke out across other parts of the Arab world where Soleimani was seen as a sadistic suppressor and war criminal who used violence and terror to maintain brutal control over civilians. The US drone strike which killed Soleimani was carried out in retaliation for an earlier attack on the American embassy in Baghdad by Iranian-backed militants under Soleimani's direction. U.S. intelligence had also discovered that Soleimani was working on plans to blow up the embassy, the finding which undoubtedly finally sealed his fate. The embassy raid followed airstrikes by U.S. forces on Iranian-controlled Hezbollah militia who had earlier fired rockets on Soleimani's orders at a U.S. base in northern Iraq killing an American contractor and injuring several military personnel. Soleimani's death triggered a barrage of ballistic missile strikes from Iran targeting American and coalition forces in Iraq. In all, some 22 missiles were fired, 17 hit the Anal Assad airbase west of Ramadi, 5 were aimed at the Abril airbase in the northern Kurdish region of Iraq, with 1 hitting the base and 4 missiles failing to reach their targets. 
Tehran described it as a crushing revenge, killing over 80 American soldiers in retaliation for the assassination of Soleimani. In reality, no Americans were injured and damage to buildings was limited. Tehran deployed two types of missiles in the attack. There was the Qiyam, a locally made version of the Soviet Union Scud C missile, and the Fatah 110, which is based on an unguided artillery rocket. The Qiyam, Persian for uprising, is an old short-range liquid-fueled ballistic missile dating back to the 1980s. It can carry a 700 kilogram warhead over a distance of around 800 kilometers. It was developed from the Iranian Shahab-2 missile, which Tehran built under license from North Korea and is based on Pyongyang's Hwasong-6 missile, which is basically a Scud C. The Fatah, Persian for Conqueror, is an Iranian-built road mobile single-stage solid-fuel surface-to-surface missile with a range of about 300 kilometers and carrying a 600-kilogram warhead. It's based on Iran Zelzal, or Earthquake, unguided 610mm artillery rocket, essentially by adding a basic guidance system to it. The Zelzal itself is thought to be based on an earlier Soviet Union-era 9K-52 Lunar M missile. Had it all ended there, it probably would have been the end of the story. But then Iran's actions were compounded when Tehran shot down a Ukrainian airline's Boeing 737, killing all 176 people on board. The plane was blown up by two Russian-made SA-15 surface-to-air missiles fired by the Iranian military. But Tehran denied the allegations. They refused to hand over the aircraft's black box recorders and instead claimed the plane had suffered mechanical problems. Later, as international pressure grew, Iran said it would allow air crash investigators from Boeing and Ukraine onto the crash site, but then quickly bulldozed the area, removing most of the evidence. Finally, after growing world condemnation, the Islamic Republic finally admitted that it had lied and it had shot down the aircraft, killing all on board. And that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audioboom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web that I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary, and you can also find us on the Spacetime with Stuart Gary YouTube channel. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 